have you ever received a gift? And have you noticed when you're given the gift how much uh, excitement, eagerness there is? Uh, you wonder what's, what's in the box, what's there, and you're excited about it. Can you remember a particular gift that you received that kind of stands out more than any other gift you ever got? You know, what, what gift have you get, was given to you over the years that just kind of stands out? I have one in my life that stands out more than any other gift that I've ever received. I, I've forgotten many, many, many of the others. I don't know. I can't remember what they were, and they've all gone. But this one, I have never forgotten it. I've remembered it all my life. And uh, it was when we were, my wife and I were at school in Lincoln, Nebraska, and uh, we were absolutely so poor. Uh, I can't describe to you how poor we were. Uh, it's just uh, so much that it was my birthday. I didn't think she'd get me a present. I, didn't, I mean, she didn't have any money to buy it with, period. I mean, there was no such thing as having money to go get me a gift with. There wasn't such. And so I didn't expect anything. But my birthday came, and, uh, and sure enough, there was a box, a little box, uh, and she gave it to me for my, my birthday. And I didn't have any idea what it was. And I can remember opening the box, and as I took the lid off and looked inside, there was a lollipop. A sucker that she had bought me for my birthday. Uh, that, uh, that gift has stayed in my mind and in my heart more than anything else because to me it was a symbol of her love and devotion uh, to me and it just had a special meaning to me. Well, God has gifts that he wants to give you, uh, definite gifts he wants to give you, and the gifts that God gives to you, uh, how should I put it? aren't so much to do with the physical part of it, folks. God wants to give you gifts that deal with the spiritual side of it. That's the gifts he wants to give you. And because the physical part, that's not going to stay around. You know, it says the flesh profiteth nothing. It, it isn't. But the spirit is what is life and what lives. And so God wants to give you gifts that deal with the spirit. And you'll find that there are several gifts in the Bible. I mean, not just one or two, but a lot of different gifts that are given in God's Word. In fact, the Scripture gives three lists of gifts that God wants to give. And I'm going to read with you those three lists so you'll know what they are. And these are gifts that God wants to give to you and to me. So the first one we're reading about is in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. And here, God lists gifts he wants to give. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of how many? Be very clear that God gives you a gift, and that gift is not for just you. Uh, it's not something that you hoard. It's not something that's just for you. That gift's given for the profit of all. Very, very important. For to one is given the word of wisdom, to the other, the, through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge, through the same Spirit. Those are two gifts. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another the gift of healings by the same Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another discerning of spirits. To another different kinds of tongues. To another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same self-spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Those are gifts. We just read nine gifts that God wants to give to you and to me. And it has a very definite purpose that we'll talk about in just a moment. There are other gifts that are listed here in Romans, the 12th chapter and verse 6 talks about gifts that God gives. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given us, let us use them. These are the gifts he gives. If prophecy, let us what? Prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, 
Let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Those are gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to you and I that we are to use. Now, God gives five gifts for the church. Five gifts for the church. And he spells them out very clearly. And he says these are the five gifts that he gives for the church. And when I'm saying to the church, that is for the operation of the church. For how it should operate and take place. And he himself gave some to be, what? Apostles. Apostles, uh, apostles folks, are people in leadership. Uh, that's what that's referring to. They are the ones who guide and direct in the affairs of the church and the leadership in that respect, referred to as apostles. And then it says some prophets gives a gift to the church because that is helpful to the church to know where it's going, where it's headed. To some evangelists, and that's for the spreading of the gospel, and some pastors and teachers. Those five gifts are given to the church, and they're given for the work of the church. That's what they're to be used for. And those are gifts that the Holy Spirit gives. By the way, that doesn't apply just to clergy. Amen. That doesn't apply just to clergy. That applies to the work of the church. And that includes all of us, not just one, but all of us. It says, for the what? The equipping of the saints. That's more than clergy. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And we have, I have known many laymen who God has given a gift to that they do outstanding jobs in these five areas. So God gives those gifts and they are to be used in the work of the church as it takes place. Now, he lists nine gifts that he gives and those gifts are to be used. The thing of it is, is it says that Christ is the head of the church. That's what it says. It says Christ is the head of the church. And the Bible says here in Corinthians, it says that the church is the body. What it describes it, the church is the body. And it says that you and I are members of that body. Okay, have we got in the picture? Christ is the head. Church is the body. And you and I are members of that body. Okay. Paul takes that theme up and talks about it here in the 12th chapter. And he says, if the foot should say, because I'm not the hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? In other words, if the foot says, I don't like being the foot, I want to be the hand. Okay. No, just because it doesn't like being the foot, no, it's still part of the body. And by the way, it's just as important as the hand. And so some of us are the eyes, some of us are the feet, some of us are the hands, some of us are the ears. We are all different parts of God's body, but every part is important. Okay? So he puts it all together. He goes on and says, And if the ear should say, Because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the ear doesn't like it and wants to be the eye, no, it's still part of the body, and it fulfills a very definite function and purpose in the body. Are you following that? Because I find that sometimes church members don't follow that very well. Watch. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? The whole body was the eye, where would be the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? Uh, you know, it's not just one, it's all of us, we're members. But now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as what? He pleases. Now, what I'm trying to tell you is God has put you in the church 
just exactly where he wants you. That's what that's saying. He's put you there just exactly where he wants you, and you and I are to fulfill the purpose by which he has called us to do with the gifts that he has given us. Now, let me tell you what bothers me. What bothers me is let's say that I wake up some morning with a toothache, and my tooth is really hurting me. And I, uh, I go and uh, get something to try to deaden the pain a little bit until I can get to the uh, dentist. And I go into the bathroom and see if I've got something there in the medicine cabinet that I can put there by that tooth to, to deaden the pain and just give me some relief until I can get to the dentist. And I go in the bathroom and I get ready to get whatever I have in the medicine cabinet and my hands won't move. Uh, you know, I, I can't pick up my hands. And uh, pretty soon my hands say, well, that's good enough for you. You shouldn't have been eating so much sugar. You ought to have known better. That's what you get for the, what you've been doing. You shouldn't do that. Uh, is that the way my hands treat my tooth? Huh? No, my hands sympathize with my tooth. It tries to help and relieve the problem that I'm having. I don't understand when each one of you are members in the body, and yet I hear some member saying of another member, good enough for him, shouldn't have done that. No, that isn't what you do. You sympathize with the person. You sympathize them. You help them. You know, we sing a song. Sing a song and say, you may notice that we say brothers and sisters around here. It's because we are a family, and these folks are so dear. If one has a heartache, we all shed the tear and rejoice in each victory in this family so dear. That's what God wants us to be, folks. That's what we are to be. God has placed you in the church, in the body of Christ, and you have a purpose for being there, and I don't care who you are. You have a purpose. You have a place in God's body. And he calls us to work within that place. Now, he tells us clearly that he gives us these things to be witnesses. Acts 1, verse 8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be what? Witnesses, witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So he says clearly that you and I are to be witnesses, and he gives these gifts to us to make our witness effective. Did you follow me? Without the gift of God, your witness will not be effective. Gives us those gifts to make us effective. And what you have to realize is it's not your place, not my place, to get out on my knees and plead with God to give me a certain gift. That is not what the Scripture teaches. The Scripture does not teach that I should get down on my knees and plead with God for the gift of tongues. It just doesn't teach that. This is what it teaches. But one and the same Spirit works in all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. In other words, it makes it clear that the Holy Spirit gives us whatever gift He wants us to have. It is not up to you, it's not up to me to say, Lord, I need this particular gift. He gives us what gift he wants us to have because he knows us a whole lot better than we know ourselves. But now God has set the members, that's each one of you, each one of them in the body just as he pleases. So he gives us which, whichever gift he would like us to have, he gives us that gift, and that is what we are to use. Now, there are nine gifts 
that are given for witnessing, as I mentioned. How do you know your gift? Well, as we found out in our last presentation, when we talked about fruits of the Spirit, that you and I are to have all the fruits of the Spirit. Those are to be in our lives, and we're supposed to grow in them and all, and those are to be present. Not, that's not that way in the gifts of the Spirit. In the gifts of the Spirit, He gives us one gift. He may give somebody two gifts. But it's the Holy Spirit that gives us what gift He wants us to have. And so He gives us different gifts of the Spirit. So I need to look and watch for what gift He wants to give me. Secondly, folks, I need to be very, very clear. And I'm telling you how to know what your gift is. Be very clear on what the Bible teaches. So spend time, read 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14. Understand clearly what God teaches about these gifts. And then, I just need to watch for them. Secondly, they come as a result of prayer. And so I need to pray that God will show me the gift he's given me and that I will bring, bring it about in my life. Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said this to him, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Paul said the gift is in you. It's present with you. Spend time in prayer. Stir it up. Use that gift that God has given you. Friend, That we shouldn't allow that gift just to lie there dormant. I need to be using it. It's very important for it to be used. You and I must be teachable. I must surrender. Uh, folks, I cannot say enough of how important it is that we surrender ourselves to be used of the Holy Spirit. I, I must do that for that gift to operate in my life and do what needs to be done. So be teachable, be willing, be flexible. Let God use you in a special way. All right, let's take a look at these nine gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us for witnessing. It says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So it's given to each one of us for everybody. That's part of the gift. All right. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gift of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. Those are the nine gifts that are given. Now, I'm going to talk about them in a little different order, and three of them I'm going to put to the very end. And the reason I'm putting them to the very end is because they are very public to begin with, and because they are misused today in a very definite way. One of the gifts that's given is wisdom. That's a gift that the Holy Spirit gives. Now, folks, that word wisdom means somebody who can uh, give good counsel, somebody who has uh, a, a more than just book knowledge. They have the ability to understand life and give good counsel in relationship to what God says. That does not have a great lot to do with formal education. Okay? I'm sorry. Uh, I have seen people who have lots of formal education that don't have much wisdom. And I've seen people who had very little formal education that had great wisdom. And those are the type of people that I'm going to look for and hunt if I need counsel, that's somebody I want to talk to is someone that God gave the gift of wisdom to. 
That's a gift that's given. To another is given the gift of knowledge. Uh, that's what I call book learning. Uh, they have knowledge, book learning. Or they've been able to apply things they've learned in life, and they have uh, knowledge that way. But they, I went to school with a young man that I believed had the gift of knowledge because I can remember we would, uh, we would sit there in the room and uh, be studying Greek. And I'd be over at the desk pouring over the Greek book, and he had sat on his bed and strum his guitar and page through the Greek book, you know. And when we took tests, he'd make A's, I'd make B's. I mean, it, he just seems to be a walking encyclopedia. And even to this day, folks, I can pick up the phone and call him, and I can ask him about places or dates, and he can just spiel them off. I mean, just seems to be a walking encyclopedia has tremendous amount of knowledge. But if I need counsel, I don't call him because he doesn't have horse sense. <laughs> See? You understand what I'm talking about? There's a difference between wisdom and there's a difference between that and knowledge. But both of those are gifts of the Spirit. It's given by the Holy Spirit. It makes a big difference. To another is given faith. Now, every one of you is given the gift of faith. But when it's listed here, it's more than just the gift of faith. It's much larger, much bigger. And you've known people, I'm sure, that seem to have the gift of faith. They just have a tremendous faith that they can reach out and take hold of things and believe. That's a gift that's given to them by God. That gift is very important. Those are gifts that are given to you and to me. To another, prophecy. Now, the next three gifts that I'm going to talk about here are given to help us understand where we're going, what's happening. And prophecy is one of those gifts that God uses. And that gift of prophecy takes place several ways. One, it takes place by the study of God's Word. As I pick up the Bible and I read the prophecies, the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, and it helps me understand where we're headed, what's happening, what takes place. That's prophecy, folks. That's God put it down there. It helps us know that. Then there's other people that God gives the gift of prophecy to. They are able to see the future and understand what is coming. And, of course, you and I understand that was done in the writings of Ellen G. White. And we can pick up her books and read them in which she talks about things that are coming. And we understand it. And by the way, you know, I wasn't born yesterday, as you well know. And so I've been, I've been here for a good while. And I've been following the Lord for a good while. And I have been reading the writings of Ellen G. White for a long time. And I'll just tell you this. The prophecies that she made have all been fulfilled as she said they would be. Amen. See? Because God gave those. Those take place. So you and I have the gift of prophecy among us or to people. And I believe particularly in the last days, the gift of prophecy will be prevalent. I believe that many will have that gift in the last days as we face serious times, God will bless and help lead and guide His church that way. So that's the gift of prophecy it's given. To another, the discerning of spirits. In other words, God gives to that individual the ability to know whether it's of God or whether it's not. Peter. Peter had the gift of discerning of spirits. I mean, that's very clearly taught in Scripture. That was a gift that Peter had. You remember, Ananias and Sapphira came in there. Ananias said, yeah, we sold the property. This is how much we got. And Peter said, no, Ananias, why are you lying to God? See, he, he discerned what was there. He understood the situation. So you and I will find that there will be people in the church that have that ability. Let, let me just say this, folks. You have to be very careful in these areas. 
I must make sure that what I am saying harmonizes and agrees with the Word of God. Amen. Never, 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 put it down, will God give you something and show you something that will go contrary to this book. It just doesn't happen. And if it is in not, if it is not in agreement with the Word of God, recognize it as that and stop it. Amen. I run on to people who come and they have some prophecy that is totally out of context with God's Word and they want you to accept it, believe it as the Word of God. No way. No way. It will always harmonize with the Word of God if it's from the Lord. So make sure when it comes to prophecy, when it comes to the discerning of spirit, you have to make sure this is of God. This is what the Lord says. The interpretation of tongues. Interpretation of tongues is given. It's given one to put a check on the use of tongues. It's there to put a check on the use of tongues. In other words, that person has the ability to interpret what is being said and they know if it is of God or if it is not. Very, very vital thing that has to take place in our lives and to be used. These are gifts that God gives. Now the last three, as I told you, are gifts that are very public and they're also very, very misused today. And therefore we need to be very clear on what God's Word says about these gifts and how they are used. One is healing. Now, the Scripture is crystal clear when it comes to healing. Does God heal? Absolutely. No question God heals. That is true. But there are certain things about healing that the Scripture also makes clear. It tells us that if somebody's sick, exactly what we are to do. And this is what it tells us here in James. It says, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So the Scripture tells us clearly that if somebody is sick, that they're to call the elders of the church, pray for that person, and the prayer of faith will save the sick. Nowhere, nowhere in Scripture does it ever say that I should wholesale it. Yeah, and I find that's done today. It's abused uh, unbelievably. It's used to uh, advertise and all this kind of stuff. No, that's not what Christ did, and that's not what the Scripture teaches. It simply says if they're sick, call the elders of the church and pray for them. Anointing them with oil, the prayer of faith will save the sick. I will remember I was holding a meeting in Louisville, Kentucky. A little girl, uh, 10 years of age, came to me and she said, uh, Brother Cox, I have a very serious uh, condition. In fact, it's life-threatening. And when the meetings here are over, my parents are taking me to Mayo's uh, for physical. And if they can't find out or figure out how to solve it, then it probably will take my life. It was a kidney condition. And uh, she said, I just wondering if you'd pray for me. And I told her, I said, young lady, I'll be glad to pray for you. But I said, why don't we just call some of the other pastors and have an anointing service and anoint you? And she said, okay. And so we got the pastors together and we had anointing service and prayed for her and anointed her with oil. And, uh, you know, folks, there wasn't any lightning uh, there wasn't anything like that. We just prayed for her, as the Scripture said, and anointed her as God's Word said. When the meetings were over, her parents took her to Mayo's. And uh, 
They had had her there for about two days running tests on her, and the doctors called in the parents, and they said, uh, doctor said to them, said, now, uh, we've run tests now for two days, and they said, uh, we can't find any problem. And, uh, and the parents said, well, great. The mother said, we'll take her home. And the doctor said, no, you're not going to take her home. Said, we're going to keep her two more days because we want to continue to run some tests. They said, in fact, they said, you brought all the medical records, so we know there's been a problem because you got all the records here. In fact, she's previously had surgery for this problem and said, we can't even find any signs of that. They, and so they kept her two more days, never could find anything, sent her home. That's been, oh, folks, I don't know, that's probably been 30 years ago. That woman's grown, has children, sends me a Christmas card regularly and all. You know, God healed her, just took away the whole thing. God does that. That's a promise that he gives us. That's healing. But, dear friend, please, it's not something that we want to, like it's for the benefit of all. It's not for something that we're going to wholesale or talk about in that sense. It's something that we do and give all the glory and honor to the Lord. All right? The other is tongues, speaking in tongues. Scripture clear about tongues and you need to understand exactly what the, te the Scripture teaches concerning tongues. And so that's what we're going to look at. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. This is when the Holy Spirit was poured out. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now here they were, as we found out in our previous deal, they were Jews and they were there and the Holy Spirit was poured out and they began to speak in other tongues, talking in other languages, if you please. Now Paul gives us very, very clear counsel about this. Listen to what he says here. I wish you all spoke with tongues. He said, be nice if all of you had spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied, for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues. Why is that? Why would he say the person who prophesies is greater than the person who speaks in a tongue? Well, he goes on and tells you why. Unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. Paul is saying, if I stand up here and I speak in a tongue, a language that you don't understand, if I speak to you tonight in Swahili, none of you are going to understand. He said, much better that I speak to you in a language that you can understand. But now, brother, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching. He said, I've got to speak to you by something that you can understand. That's what he's trying to say. Yet in the church, I'd rather speak, how much? Five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. He said, if I just talk to you with a language you don't understand, not going to help you. But he said, much better that I said five words to you that you could understand. So, yes, tongues is a gift. No question about that, folks. But it tells us exactly how it's to be used. Watch this. It's telling you now exactly how it's to be used. If anyone speaks in a tongue, okay, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. Now, folks, that direction is just as clear as it can be. It said if there's going to be somebody speaking a tongue, let there be one or two or at the most three. None of this stuff that you see happening 
where you've got 15, 20 people all standing on their feet speaking in an unknown tongue. That is not of God. That's confusion. That's right. hey, the Bible is clear. It's to be one, two, or at the most, three. Now listen. And it says, each in turn. What does that mean? One at a time. Doesn't mean all of them at the same time. It means one at a time is to speak. And if there is no interpreter, let one interpret. That's to put the check on it that I talked about. And if there is no interpreter, let him what? Keep silent, Keep silent church, and let him speak to himself and to God. So the Scripture is very, very clear how tongues are to be used. It is a gift, and it's used, and it has great power and it does great good in many places where God's Spirit uses it. But we need to make sure that we're letting the Holy Spirit lead as we use it. The last one is miracles. What the Scripture has to say about miracles. Truly, the sign of an apostle was accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. You'll find in the early church a sign of an apostle was someone who performed miracles. And God used it as a sign of their position and place. They were apostles. Therefore, they stayed there a long time, speaking of Paul and Silas and so forth, boldly, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the words of His grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So they performed miracles. Now, God performs miracles. That's a, that's a gift that's given. I had a friend, I believe, that had that gift because I walked sideways every time I got around him because something strange was going to happen. They just seemed to have that gift. But it's a gift of miracles. But you must understand that the devil can perform miracles. So you cannot let miracles be the basis of your belief. Amen. The coming of a lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, you see. For they are the spirit of demons performing what? Signs, that's miracles, which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So what am I to do? Uh, what am I to do if somebody predicts something, says it's going to happen, or, or they, they work a miracle? Uh, can I believe that, and can I accept that? Uh, how, how am I to relate to that? I want you to listen. Because here in Deuteronomy, it tells you exactly how you and I are to relate to this. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, he predicts something's going to happen, or he even performs a miracle, okay? And the sign or the wonder come to pass just exactly like he said it happened of which he spoke to you saying let us go after other gods which we have not known and let us serve them he tries to lead you away from what you know is right lead you contrary to God you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, knows whether you are. So he's telling us that we are to follow him. Listen, this is what you're to do. You shall walk with the Lord your God, fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and what? Hold fast to him. Yes, it says clearly that you and I are to hang on to the Lord. I am to follow his word I am to walk as God teaches me. You see, dear friend, it's very important that I make sure that these signs that Christ has given, these gifts that he's given, that they are used as God would have you use them. Yes, 
you need to desire them. In fact, it says this, pursue love and desire what? Spiritual gifts. That's what we're supposed to do, pursue love. Desire spiritual gifts. Even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. So he says clearly that you and I are to seek spiritual gifts. That makes your witness effective. That's why many, many uh, Christians live unaffected lives. It's because they don't receive the gifts of the Spirit. So sure, I need to pray for the infilling of God's Spirit. I need to pray that God will make that gift prevalent in my life and that I will use it as God wants me to. So we need to follow the Lord in His way.